Hi everyone, this is Dr. Stefan. Welcome to Interstitial Lung Disease Info. In this episode, I'd like to talk about screening for pulmonary fibrosis or lung scarring or other forms of interstitial lung diseases in general. And this is an important topic because we currently don't really have a very good treatment to reverse pulmonary fibrosis. We can't reverse it with the current treatments, but we know that we have methods of managing the condition or treating it so that the progression of the disease can be slowed down or stabilized. So I think this is to do with finding a cause in many situ situations. And if we can remove that cause, if it's like an environmental problem, for example, someone who's working on farms and they're exposed to certain things and we, they stop doing that job, potentially that's affecting their lungs, that could prevent the condition from developing. Or if there is an underlying condition that they're suffering from, for instance, an, a connective tissue disease or things like uh, Sjogren's disease or systemic sclerosis and they're on effective treatment for that, that could prevent the lungs from getting worse. And treatments could vary from um, all kinds of uh, anti-inflammatories, immunosuppressant medications, so things that would reduce the re response of the body, the immune response of the body, so that can sometimes stabilize uh, an interstitial lung disease that's been diagnosed. Or sometimes we just offer antifibrotic or anti-scarring medication that tends to slow down the worsening of the scarring over time. So Obviously, in this context, you can imagine if we don't have a treatment that reverses the scarring, but we have treatments that potentially could stabilize or slow down the condition, it's quite important if we can try and catch these things early. So finding pulmonary fibrosis early becomes a little bit of a mission for physicians or for patients who may be at risk as well. So I think in this video, I'll cover a few things around what is screening, um, when is early ILD diagnosed, what may be the features of that, what kind of scans we might need, and just a few groups of people who might be at higher risk of having potentially interstitial lung disease. So I'll talk about a little bit about this next. First of all, I'm not your ILD physician, I'm not your healthcare provider, so please consult, on, you know, discuss all this information that you're hearing in my videos or what you find in other places online, discuss it with your healthcare team, because they will be the best people to actually be able to advise what you may need, what sort of scans you may need, what sort of follow-up you may need. Everyone is so different. That being said, I think it's important to understand what screening is. So what screening may mean in your case and someone else's case. So basically, it's a situation in which we are trying to test people for early signs of pulmonary fibrosis before the symptoms appear. So sign is something that we can measure, hear, see, whereas a symptom is something that you're experiencing. So this is the difference there. So we're looking for signs that you may not be able to pick up in order to detect and treat pulmonary fibrosis early. So this is the role of screening. The problem that we have, the main problem that we have, is that early pulmonary fibrosis can be very, very subtle. And you may not feel any different. Often it's not visible on simple chest x-rays. So, which is a simple picture of the lung you may, you may take if, you, if you're thinking this could be a good way to screen. It's probably not a good way to screen for the very earliest cases. If you have more extensive fibrosis, that would become visible. But in the, at the beginning, at the very beginning, it may not look any different. You may have a completely normal chest x-ray. The other thing is that the lung function tests, the breathing tests, spirometry, things like that. You're going into the, the lab, you're blowing into this tube, you're getting some numbers, lung volumes, etc. Those could actually be normal in the very early cases because there's not enough damage to the lungs to cause a functional impairment that we can detect. And we also do not often have historical lung functions, so values that have been measured one year ago, two years ago, five years ago, because that would potentially give us a trend of what is going on, a trend of decline. So in the absence of this information, the best way to actually detect early pulmonary fibrosis is with a chest CT scan or a CAT scan which is a co computed tomography. This is what CT stands for, but it's basically cross-sectional imaging of the chest. So slices, for lack of a better term, through the, the chest, you go through the machine to the chest CT scanner. And then that gives us a three-dimensional picture of where the abnormalities may be. So this is often not specifically done for detecting interstitial lung disease or pulmonary fibrosis. In many cases, the interstitial lung disease can be picked up early because a scan has been done for a different reason. So this is important to keep in mind because a lot of cases may be picked up incidentally because we're looking for something else, but these abnormalities that look like pulmonary fibrosis or scarring are picked up just for another reason. So often people may have a scan 
because of an abdominal problem. So the scan just catches the bottom of the lungs a little bit as well when we're scanning the abdomen. And then that could show some signs that there is pulmonary fibrosis there. Or potentially it could be that there is a suspected blood clot migrating to the lungs, a pulmonary embolism, and someone has a chest scan to look for that clot with contrast, but that catch, catches the lung tissue as well. And we can see some changes sometimes. Or for instance, it could be in the situation where people might have an accident, a trauma, they have an injury, they require a chest CT scan to be done for that reason. And that picks up some underlying abnormalities. Another situation potentially is when there is active lung cancer screening. So for instance, this is a thing that uh, th this is often a program that's offered to people who have smoked for many, many years and they're at high risk of developing lung cancer and often a low dose radiation CT scan is given to rule out the presence of cancer. So oftentimes there is no cancer found, but potentially in with variable prevalence, of course, but maybe like 7% of cases potentially could have, um, there are different numbers quoted for this, but maybe 7% of these scans that are negative for cancer could actually pick up some early signs of pulmonary fibrosis. So that could be a high number as well that comes through these programs. So we know that a CT scan is probably the ideal test to look for very early pulmonary fibrosis. But this is, however, not easy to implement. And you can understand why, because CT scanning is expensive. It's, it's not a very common test to be done. Uh, there are waiting lists, there is radiation involved, a lot more probably than from a simple chest x-ray. And then the other thing would be that maybe if we pick up some early signs of pulmonary fibrosis, we're not entirely sure often whether those will actually get worse or not. So we may worry patients unnecessarily. The other thing is the follow-up is not often clear. So we often don't really have the capacity itself in clinics to follow up these very early cases because there are so many other patients that are coming through the clinic. So we may not be able to follow these cases up appropriately. The other thing is, and we're working on this a little bit, how can we actually do the scan at the optimal time point? Because once we've picked up these abnormalities, we probably need to repeat the scan. Maybe that would be in one year, in two years, in three years, in five years. We don't know the optimal time to repeat that scan. So that causes worry and anxiety for people because they're not sure what's going on. So. Obviously, it's important in this scenario to try to select groups of people who might benefit from ILD screening the most. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, so basically, the first thing would be, I think, in my mind, would be to try to raise awareness more. This is what I'm trying to do through these videos, but there are patient representatives, there are all kinds of groups and individuals who are trying to talk about these things more because probably there needs to be a better understanding of interstitial lung diseases in general overall in, in the medical world and among patients in primary care family doctors gps other non-respiratory non-pulmonologist doctors relatives of people who might be suffering with pulmonary fibrosis potentially could be at higher risk people who are diagnosed as i was saying at the beginning with autoimmune diseases again they may be at higher risk and it's important to integrate the awareness that interstitial lung disease could be present with a good history and with the clinical examination, because that can give us some indications who might benefit the most from having a CT scan. So let's talk a little bit about autoimmune diseases or connective tissue diseases. So things like rheumatoid arthritis, like scleroderma or systemic sclerosis, inflammatory myositis, Sjogren's, things like that. So the reason why I'm saying that is because I will put a reference below, but the prevalence of interstitial lung disease among people diagnosed with these conditions can be quite high. Now, these conditions are fortunately not very common, so they are also quite rare. So then within this group, people who may be diagnosed with connective tissue diseases, some people will develop ILD. But trying to to work from there is probably important. So if someone is diagnosed, for instance, with systemic sclerosis, or, which is a condition affecting the skin, the skin gets thickened, potentially up to 47% of patients with this condition may develop a form of ILD. So being aware of respiratory symptoms in this patient group might lead to an earlier diagnosis. And in things like rheumatoid arthritis, which is not that uncommon, which is an inflammatory joint disease generally affecting the fingers, 
up to 11% of patients may actually develop an ILD. So that's again a high number to, to think about. Uh, inflammatory myositis, so this is basically inflammation affecting the muscles. It's a group of conditions, different types. Uh, sometimes they can have mixed presentations. Up to about 40% can actually develop an ILD. For Sjogren's disease, which is another connective tissue disease um, associated with dryness of the mucosal surfaces, so dry mouth, dry eyes, up to 17% can develop interstitial lung disease. So a higher risk in this group of individuals who may have these conditions. So they might benefit potentially, especially in the situation where they develop some respiratory symptoms, they might benefit from having a chest CT scan. I haven't talked about exposure specifically, but you can think about things like having exposures, known history of exposure to silica dust, to asbestos, working in mines, working with organic dust as a farmer, keeping chickens, things like that, being in, in places that are very moldy and damp. All of these things may increase the risk of potentially having an interstitial lung disease. So potentially keeping in mind that that could be an issue is important. The other thing that's really a group of people that probably should be aware that screening might be recommended and the guidelines may change on this in the future is people who have family history of pulmonary fibrosis. So it is known that uh, if there is a diagnosis of idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis in the family, there is a 10% prevalence um, increase in relatives. And uh, that is actually been looked at in different ways. So in patients who, in people who have um, a sporadic case of IPF in the family, so someone who's been diagnosed with the idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis or IPF, potentially up to 30% of their relatives could have interstitial lung abnormalities when we do a CT scan. So that's pretty high. It's a pretty high number. So people probably need to be aware that if they do develop some problems with their breathing, it's a good idea to maybe go check with their healthcare providers whether they would need such a screening. And the problem with family history is that many doctors don't ask about family history of ILD and many patients with ILD don't tell. So this is something that hopefully we can work through together because there is indeed a higher risk. And if there are many, many cases of interstitial lung disease in someone's family, there's a higher risk that other people could have it as well because there can be high risk genetic abnormalities that might be driving this. Now, whether that's going to impact the progression, that can be a discussion, depends on the, the gene that's affected and other things, but there is potentially higher risk that an interstitial lung disease could be present that would require optimal management. I haven't touched upon the examination of the patient yet, but that's really important as well. So just listening as a doctor with the stethoscope to the person's chest can give us some indications. So especially if we're listening for Velcro crackles or crepitations, this is the specific sound that we learn about in medical school. But actually identifying that in people who does, don't have really have respiratory symptoms probably could be an indication that there may be pulmonary fibrosis there, unless there is an alternative explanation such as heart failure or some something else. So this is where I think the doctor's hand, the doctor's ear is important to try to determine whether there could be in the presence of the above risk factors that I mentioned, an indication to do a chest CT scan. Because if someone, for example, has family history of interstitial lung disease, they may have an autoimmune disease. When the doctor listens to their chest, they have these Velcro crackles. Probably they would need to have a chest CT scan to rule out that there isn't an interstitial lung disease, there isn't pulmonary fibrosis there causing all of this. There can be other things that people can listen for. So things such as squeaks or <laughs> another more medical term would be end inspiratory wheeze. This is something that can be often heard in a condition such as hypersensitivity pneumonitis. So again, if there is awareness among the primary care physicians and among other non-respiratory doctors about these things, we could potentially use the physical examination, integrating it with potential risk factors to determine who might need a scan to rule out the presence of an ILD or pulmonary fibrosis. It's always a matter of integrating the entire clinical picture. So I'm hoping that we will start to do that more rather than being siloed into uh, one specific specialty or the other, because that makes it really difficult for patients to have holistic care. Now, obviously that's easier said than done because of resources and so, so many other things, but I, it's probably a point that I need to raise. 
And with all this info that I've provided, which is quite a lot, I think it's a matter of deciding who will or will not be screened with a chest CT scan. This is not an easy decision, but it probably needs to be a, a patient involvement in there, a shared decision making between the doctor and the patient. So that's why I urge you to kind of discuss all of these issues with your healthcare provider to determine what's the best course of action for you. The idea with screening for ILD is that if we are able to treat a condition earlier, it's probably better, or at least to monitor if, if we find it early. So hopefully this was helpful. If you have further questions, do leave them in the comment section below. I will be leaving a couple of notes, a couple of references to some of the publications, that uh, the scientific publications that I found that I think are quite relevant for this topic. These will be in the description below. Thank you very much for watching, for listening, and all the best and good health.